Okay, so it is Thursday night, 7.05 p.m. on November 17th, 2022. And this is a video I truly never in my life ever imagined that I would be journaling. I am getting ready to catch a plane at 7.30 in the morning in an effort to nothing short of flee and escape what is becoming a lynch mob online. Tell her how many comments were there. 777. Are you serious? Yes. Man, I wish you would have taken a screen capture of that. When you looked, there were 777 comments? There was. Wow. So this 21-year-old girl, Taylor, that put this video out, it's turned into something like a disaster. Uh, Tyler has checked and there's 777 comments in, I don't know, since October 1st now. And it's turned into like a lynch mob against me. People wanting to try to find where I live, which I keep hidden always the whole ministry because I've had people just show up at the door before. Um, like I, I've had a stalker before. I had one man drive all the way from New York and show up at my door. So I keep my address always hidden. Everybody's always known that. But now there's people acting like I am some sort of a criminal. There's my ex-wife showing up accusing me of potentially murdering the boy who's holding the phone right now to prevent him from having a quote relationship with her. Again, accusing me of 13 years of not paying child support. All the lies that the judge said to her, stop telling. She's now just added three years to it since we've been to court saying I'm a con man and all the money I've received is fraudulent. And then the lady who I rebuked for her sin, not because she didn't give me the rest of the money, but because she said she did and she didn't do the right thing and because she allowed a lie to stand in the way that could have so easily been prevented. And because I rebuked her and because I dismissed her because I could no longer trust her, she now turned and went to one of my best friends to dump on him. And now she's gone in the comments section and apparently dozens of people are believing her and talking about, let's get the authorities. Let's try to find Michael. Let's try to get your money back. I can't, this is insane on a level. I had never dreamed in all these years of ministry. Now I can say I've seen it all. And I had somebody drive by this condo today and I saw the person drive by very slow then come back by very slow and they stopped right in front of my door. And I just had this sense that somebody was perhaps trying to look for me, like having looked for my address. It wouldn't be too easy to, too hard to find. And I told Lisa, I think that people are trying to find me as if I've done something wrong and I've done nothing wrong. And then I had seen these scriptures, which I'll include at another point. And before I knew it, God had confirmed for me in the most remarkable way that he wants me to leave, like a type of an Elijah, where you run and hide yourself at Brook Kareth, or Ezekiel, where you leave like you're going into exile with your few belongings that I have here, and you leave and go somewhere else. And God confirmed for Lisa and I today that I'm to leave. I can't even believe it. And it's amazing how a person texted me right while I was talking to Lisa about this and mentioning this person. And I couldn't believe it. This person actually texted me. If there's anything I can do to help you, having no idea what we were talking about. This was just hours ago. And as of right now, I have plane tickets. My bags are packed. They're sitting right here. I'm getting ready to leave my son. I have no idea what tomorrow holds, but I know that it's 730 in the morning. I'm on an airplane to an undisclosed location where people are looking forward to taking care of me. When I called them while I was out on a walk, I started to weep. I couldn't believe that I was having this conversation with them. It's like I've been watching these kind of things. John Wesley being attacked by mobs. Jesus Christ having to flee and run for his life, can't even go to Jerusalem. Elijah having to constantly be on the run from Ahab. Moses from Pharaoh. Moses from Israelites. I've never dreamed that I would ever see anything like this. Or being like the disciples having to be on the run for the fear of your life. When persecuted in one place, flee to another. And I believe the Lord is going to allow this thing to run itself out, and allow all the evil people get into the net that he wants, and then he'll take care of this and vindicate me and bring shame 
and all these people. I'm absolutely shocked. I cannot believe that this is a, this reminds me of what it would have been like to be an African American, perhaps in the, I don't know, 40s, 50s, 60s, or what have you, where you have this lynch mob mentality. We're going to have us a hanging tonight. And all the mob gets in with all their ignorance and they throw one lie after another lie, after another fear, after another fear. And this is the same thing that mentality that's happening when groups come after a religious man or a prophet or a man of God. I have never, I am not this important for this to have happened to. So I'm absolutely shocked that in the United States of America, my God is apparently warning me in advance that people are trying to find me and locate me to do harm to me through the law or falsely accuse me, making up all kinds of stories about me. They're not even true. And here it is this night, I'm having to run and flee. I tell you, I never in a million years imagined that I would have this experience. I almost can't even believe I'm saying this. The shame of people who call themselves Christians, all these people who I've tried to help. And this is how you're repaid. This is how Jesus Christ is repaid. This is how Paul is repaid when he has to be let down in a basket over a wall and escape. This is how Ezekiel is repaid. This is how Jeremiah is repaid. This is how they've treated all the prophets. As it says in Acts, was there ever a prophet that your fathers didn't stone to death? I mean, this is astonishing. I don't even feel like I'm qualified for this kind of persecution. And yet I do realize that Father is making a picture out of me that of what is going to happen in the end times. I've been saying it for long before people turned against me that what you've been seeing in my life for suffering is a picture where Jesus Christ said in, uh, what is it, Matthew tw uh, 21, brother will betray brother to death. Father will betray son. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. I don't need to go on about this and turn this into a sermon. We just wanted to capture, this was Tyler's idea to capture this moment. I'm at a point where I could literally weep and I'm at a point where I could flip this, this, this table over. I'm at a point where I could just laugh. I've never had this kind of an experience before. I cannot believe that I'm getting ready to leave. My son, having no idea, and I haven't even told him where I'm going. I kept it from him so that he would never have to lie and so that nobody could ever pry it out of him. I can't even believe that I'm having to say this. In the United States of America, 777 people lying and twisting the truth and casting evil suspicions. You people are going to be so ashamed of yourselves when God mocks you. Far be it from me to do anything other than what I did was to put up a video to first 30 minutes to try to be everything you've ever accused me of being for the last 10 years. The last hour and 15 minutes was the only rebuke that you will ever hear from me in correction. And I showed factually this 21 year old girl who's leading all of you astray, all of you who wanted to be left astray, all of you who were never, 1 John 2, 19, a part of us because you went out from us. Those who belong to God hear us because we belong to God. And yet, behind the scenes tonight, Tyler and I prayed for all of you. And I want you to know what you've done is disgraceful. And yet, I still love you, even though you cut me to pieces. I still pray for you, even though you have sinned against me so greatly. 777 comments spewing lie upon lie upon lie upon lie. Rumor upon rumor upon rumor. Do you know how many of you think you can do this and actually go to heaven? Have you read the Bible? Slanderers do not go to heaven. They go to hell. Liars, perjurers, backbiters. They go to hell. May God have mercy on the people who participated in this. Wow, Taylor. Sin must come into the world, but woe to those through whom it comes. It would be better for you to have never been born. You have really lit yourself a fire. And I pray God is merciful to you. You should be ashamed at what you've done. A 21-year-old girl, like some sort of a Jezebel, and I'm having to run. Who could believe in the United States of America? I'm having to run and that there's a video with people saying, let's get him, let's get him in jail. He's a fraud. He's a cheat. He's lying. He took this poor little old lady's money. You have no idea this true story about that poor little old lady who didn't even have the courage to put her real name in the comment section. You guys are talking to a person that doesn't even exist. You've already said 
countless times that you know that God has said to you that this is money that you're to give to me. You've even said that you feel this is my money in your account. Well, right now that means you're allowing your bank to steal from me simply by slandering me and calling me a fraud. And if you need my help, if you wanna get this over with and cut the throat of this lie, then you need to send Pam an email, call their bluff, Carol Ann, confront it. Don't be afraid to confront the lie. Are you afraid of Satan? You can't be afraid because he's the liar and he's the father of all who lie. You cannot be afraid to confront with the truth. We've come up against a lie and we're not addressing the lie. You're waiting as if somehow or another the lie is going to turn into the truth and it will not. We have to confront and this is an issue of the Lord's will. This isn't just like, you know, you don't have anything better to do with the money. You prayed God gave you a number. You've said that you believe that the Lord has called this my money. And I feel, I feel horrible having to have this conversation with you. Honestly, I feel like I'm getting my hands dirty. I'm going to tell you something horrible. I'm going to tell you something very honest and very horrible because I'm not afraid to tell the truth. I told Lisa that I was getting to the point where I didn't even want this money because it's getting dirty. Satan is smearing poop of unbelief all over it. I don't even want it. It's starting to look like blood money to me. This is terrible. Brothers and sisters in Christ, whoever of you end up hearing this, that are true followers of Christ, understand this is what we're all going to go through in the end times. I'm having to run from a lynch mob mentality where people are trying to look at, make it look like I need to be arrested and they're talking about putting me in prison for what? Because God told me to stop paying child support last year for kids that had been kidnapped from me nine years earlier. And finally God said, enough is enough. And the one who escaped, the only one who knows the truth sitting behind the video camera has asked me a long time ago, dad, why are you continuing to pay the child support? For kids that aren't even yours, kids that hate you. You guys should be, should be so ashamed of yourself. That's all I wanna say. I can't believe that I'm leaving tomorrow morning to an undisclosed location. My goodness gracious, unbelievable. That's enough, Tyler. I don't have anything else to say. The majority of the Jews who followed Jesus Christ were not secular. They were not atheists. They were believers and they believed they had real faith. In John 8, 39 through 47, it is written that they say to Jesus, Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. At the end of this video, which is filled with real life examples of what it means when God said in Hebrews 10, 38, that the righteous ones will live by faith. I'm going to explain the source for this kind of antagonism and persecution which will only increase from this point on, exactly as Christ and the apostles both prophesied, that would occur between professing Christians who only have a natural faith versus Christians who are in possession of a supernatural faith. Romans 9, 8 says, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. In Galatians 4, 28 through 29, Paul said, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way, Ishmael, persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit, Isaac, it is the same now. There is a natural born faith which all men are born with and which is exercised at varying degrees depending on the level of natural interest and courage they have. We use this natural faith and reasoning to take various risks in life. 
like boarding an airplane, starting a relationship, choosing a career, changing jobs, buying a home, making an investment, becoming an entrepreneur, or in the taking up of a dangerous hobby or even extreme sport. These things and many more are all done by a natural faith through our ordinary human understanding, human reasoning, decision-making skills, and risk analysis. As you will see in many of the examples in this video, from my own life, natural faith has nothing to do with a true heavenly spiritual faith, which is given as a gift. Natural faith has nothing to do with a true heavenly spiritual faith, which is given as a gift of God's grace and which is the only saving faith, assuming it perseveres to the very end. See Matthew 24, 12 and 13. A true spiritual faith given by the grace of God is a faith which often completely contradicts all human understanding and reasoning. As Christ and Paul both taught, it is the faith of our father Abraham, the faith of the twice born, the only faith which can please God, a faith which is hated by Satan, persecuted by the once born, and mocked as insanity by unregenerated worldlings. In the messages that follow after this video of my personal examples of faith, I will share many more biblical principles, insights, and teachings of great saints who have gone before us on the subject of supernatural faith in order to help professing Christians to examine their own faith and to determine, with God's help, if their faith in Jesus Christ is a natural-born faith, which is common to all men, or a supernatural faith common only to those few regenerated and born again by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. It is also my hope in this video by setting forth these practical examples and reminders of real life faith in my own walk in ministry that many who are truly born again will have their faith strengthened to the glory of God in their life. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. Hebrews thirteen seven, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. All throughout this story, the grace to love again, the odds have been stacked against us in favor of the impossible circumstances defeating our faith in God's promise. So many times in my walk of faith, the only way I could keep going forward in hope was to consciously look back and remember all the times God had faithfully delivered me in the past. Let me share with you some of my reflections on his past faithfulness and remarkable answers to prayer. My life of living by faith, actually hearing God's guidance to me and believing him to act in my behalf, even doing the impossible in response to my obedience to his will, started with me first putting God to the test. 21 years ago in 2001 with my Lord's Gym Health Club franchise. In my ignorance, I had faith in faith rather than faith in God. I thought my faith meant I should attempt something great for God and that he would support me in it because of my faith. I hadn't yet understood that God gives man faith not so that man can move God, but so that God can move man. Not so man can attempt something for God in his own initiative, but so that God can attempt something for himself through the man or woman who has obedient faith. 
In true Romans 8.28 fashion, it was in that disaster that the Lord first called me to walk by faith in his will, not mine. I was being sued for $120,000 by the largest commercial property group in the United States. The night before I was to be deposed by their attorneys in this David versus Goliath battle, the Lord had me read 2 Chronicles 20 verse 17. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. In my deposition, I spoke aided by the Holy Spirit with clear conviction and wisdom. Within just days, they agreed to drop their suit against me. It was truly a miraculous deliverance. Then, after seven years of attempting to start my life in faith over, on October 30th, 2009, I took the leap of faith, placing my entire life, family, business, and future plans all in the Lord's hands to do with exactly as he saw fit. Since that time, there has not been one significant event in my life which has not been accomplished through risky faith, which in the face of impossible circumstances always looked foolish, dangerous, or impossible to the natural minds around me. I thought that after she had done all this, she would return to me, but she did not. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. With the single exception of my second spouse not returning to God or our marriage after falling into the apostasy of Eastern mysticism, Every single risky thing the Lord has ever asked me to trust him in for the last 13 years has come to pass exactly as he promised. In 2010, I risked everything to trust him when he told me to fire my attorney in that awful divorce where I could have ended up in jail if my ex-wife had won, having spent an estimated $80,000 to try to destroy me in court. It's the day of court, we're all nervous. Court lasts nine and a half hours. Michael had told us that God had promised that he would deliver him. Uh, he knew it by the numbers that God showed him over and over and over. And that particular day, he saw those numbers in abundance in a circle. We just pull in to Larry's deal, right there's his thing. He pull in, I just kind of glanced and look at what I saw sitting right here, 5550. I get out in the street, I'm like, Larry, look at this, look at this. And then I look and right over here. And he felt so confident, he wasn't concerned at all. God told him what he was gonna do and he knew God was gonna do it. I just feel that the desire of my heart is to see the Lord do something today that brings him much glory, um, that solidifies my faith even more, gives me even more conviction in why I believe in the things I believe in God and my faith and shows me how faithful he is because he's made a lot of promises to me. Um, and I think it'll do the same thing for a lot of other people. So that's the cry of my heart today. In 2011, I trusted him risking my time and credibility when he told me to begin working on the documentary, Trusting God in the Storm, which told that first divorce story well before the astonishing deliverance had yet come about. I'm not able to see even one significant thing that God did that did not require me putting myself, my dignity, my name, or even somebody else, perhaps a family member, in danger. The divorce, my finances, living by faith all these years, the tiny house, my first trip to India, all of these things. And actually even now, telling this very story is an act of risky faith. Most people don't even know that when God asked me to tell the story of all that he had done in my life, which up to that point was trusting God in the storm, they don't realize that God had asked me to start telling the story on a promise of victory, but having yet to see it. 
the final court outcome of that divorce had not yet been determined. In fact, when God was asking me to begin to tell the story, the circumstances were contradicting that I would ever have or see the victory that God had promised me almost a year and a half earlier. So I had to put my personal dignity at stake. I had to risk also the loss of five months of my life at that point. The story took seven for me to begin to move forward by faith to tell a story that had no ending yet. He is the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. And in order to see that thing that is not become what it is, it requires risky faith. Then, in September of 2012, I finally saw the astonishing 777-day victory he brought about after only being able to see it with the eyes of faith for nearly two years. And all of a sudden, I realized that God is telling me to count the number of days between the date that my ex-wife filed for divorce, which was July 30th of 2010, and the date that I received my divorce papers on September 15th, 2012. It is 777 days. In January of 2013, I took a very risky leap of faith, trusting him to provide for my finances through prayer and faith alone. He asked me to set down my secular work and led me to never make my financial needs known to anyone. I was allowed to place a donate button on my website, but I was never allowed to point it out or ask for people to send support. To this day, 10 years after starting the ministry, he has never failed to supply my needs without any other human being ever knowing what they were. Then, in May of 2013, I trusted him taking a legal risk when he led me to place myself in what could have been contempt of court by telling me not to attend a court hearing related to the divorce. It's uh, Saturday morning, May 18th, 2013. I do not have enough money to be in court tomorrow, which I could be held in contempt, and I don't know if they can put in jail for that, or I don't know. My stepfather offered to give me the money to go to court, and I said, you know what, I, I already can tell you no before you even offered. I've seen 777 multiple times. I saw 555 first thing this morning, but God is up to something clearly. So I'm just going to continue to trust him. And I'm at a place where a normal person will look at this and say, you're headed for a disaster. You're headed off the edge of the cliff. God is absolutely strengthening me in this. And it's like, I just believe that God is going to take care of me. Five months later, in October of 2013, he led me to do the same thing again. It is now eight o'clock on October 16th, 2013. And at this very minute, it is nine o'clock in Florida and a hearing that I am supposed to be at has now started. This is the fourth hearing. Here it is a year later. Um, I'm supposed to be in the hearing, of course. The last two hearings I have not gone to. I have been in a position where I'm now dependent totally upon God. I've told the Father, Lord, if you want me to go, then you'll provide the finances for me to go. And both hearings, the last two hearings, God has just saturated them with 777s and 555s. The Lord defended me in both of these events just as he had promised. Then, in November of 2013, I trusted him regarding a child abuse situation 600 miles away with my oldest son, Tyler, at the hands of his grandfather. 9.49 on the clock. 9.49 is the scripture. What's the scripture? Does he who implanted the ear not hear? Does he who formed wow. the eye not see? Wow. He honored my prayers and faith by opening Tyler's eyes to see his guardian angel watching all of it. Tim, all he said for me to do was trust him. And now here you and I are on a phone a week later and you're telling me you see your angel sitting in your room watching over you. Even though the grandfather didn't change his attitude toward Tyler, Tyler was never once again afraid of his grandfather after this encounter with his angel. And there were no more instances of physical abuse. 
In 2014, I trusted him by faith while I was homeless to write the first version of the John 717 Discipleship Workbook and to order by faith the first 100 copies for sale, which I could barely afford. And even though I had already made a written and audio version available online for free. Eight years later, that book has sold thousands of copies, even though the Lord never let me put the book for sale anywhere outside of my own website at RelentlessHeart.com. In March of 2016, I obeyed him, risking thousands of dollars, weeks of time, and my credibility as a servant of the Lord, trusting him in faith to break the Indian government law regarding marriage registration and to overcome over 30 additional obstacles standing in the way of his plan for my remarriage in India to my second spouse. In 2016, I flew to Hyderabad, India to marry my second spouse after waiting for five and a half years for his promise. We walked by his spirit and guidance into the marriage through no less than 30 obstacles, and we saw God do the impossible to put us together. And here is, right here, this is very, very exciting. I've just arrived back from India yesterday. Persis and I took this huge risk for me to fly to India not knowing if we'd be able to get the marriage registration or not, we only knew because God told us. We stepped in faith in spite of the circumstances which completely contradicted the fact that we could get married. God did a miracle and the Indian government actually broke the rules for us. So we took this huge risk, I went over, I get married, and now there's no guarantee circumstantially that she can ever come back to the United States. We have no guarantee that it'll be approved. We only walk in faith that God has said he will do this. At that same time, I also trusted him to secure a precisely timed guaranteed U.S. visa for her to return with me to the U.S. Even though two people have said this is impossible, that it can't be done, be it to us according to our faith. I think God is saying something and I told you what? What did I tell you? It might, we might get some good news about the visa. yes yeah. and it came to pass exactly as he ordained so today's december 21st we're just minutes away from picking up the visa so i'm believing for that that we're going to see a miracle in the in the, the time that it takes to get our visa done the way it happens after seven months 21 days incredible god is to be praised this is a story i cannot wait to tell here we are then in december of 2017 i trusted him in faith for one of the riskiest tests of faith so far he told me to begin building a tiny house on wheels, even though I didn't yet have enough money to even buy the custom trailer. In something like Elijah pouring water on the sacrifice to be burned up by the Lord, proving it was the Lord God who brought the fire down from heaven and burned up the sacrifice, the house would cost more than I had ever received in previous annual incomes while working in the ministry. Then he poured even more water on it when within three days of telling me to move forward on the building of the house, he asked me to stop all ministry work that same year. This naturally meant that donations and book sales would significantly decrease since no work would be done for that entire year. Then more water was poured on the sacrifice when the Lord never let me make any of this known about the tiny house publicly until the house was already nearly finished. No one knew my increased financial needs except God alone. It all happened miraculously as he honored my faith once again to do the impossible I saw God provide in one miraculous way after another. Then in March of 2019, I took the risk again of obeying his leading to begin preparing to move to New Zealand with my then second spouse. I had an estate sale and sold every possession I had, including putting the tiny house I had just built and never even spent the first night in up for sale. I will tell you, it was a very big surprise to me um, as we got nearer and nearer to the finish of this home to find out and discover that the Lord was leading me to move to a land far, 
far away, perhaps a place you've seen in the movies before, a country called New Zealand. And when I knew that we were being called to New Zealand, I did not think I would be able to take the tiny house, but I looked into it and it was going to cost between $27,000 and $30,000, give or take, in order to get a tiny house this big to New Zealand. And that wasn't really practical and it's not part of our call. So in the end, I've said goodbye to it in our heart. I've given that gift which God gave me back to Him. And hopefully it's going to be a real rich blessing to somebody. It's really remarkable to think of all the time and energy and money that we spent and a whole year of my life taking off from the ministry to build this home, never having any idea that I was building it for somebody else. That is really remarkable. There's been a lot of prayer that's gone into this home. Being led to New Zealand in 2019 is what God used to reveal to me my spouse's unyielding spiritual apostasy and unfaithfulness when she admitted she would not be going with me to New Zealand. Soon after her refusal to go with me, New Zealand providences all but disappeared and an almost sale on the tiny house fell through. We were just going to be staying in Huntsville after all. The final water poured on the sacrifice of the tiny house came when the Lord asked me not to look for a place to park the tiny house, even though it's already nearly impossible to find a place to live in them legally here in the United States because of zoning laws. Despite pressure from relatives, I never even spent five minutes looking for a place. And just as God promised, when the time was just right, he had my own mother drive by the property two years after she had first seen it. And the owners were outside and had just been talking about renting it and said they would indeed think about it. I began praying that if this was the place for me, that he would then move on them to call us back. Two weeks later, my mother came to me at 5.55 p.m. on July 25th 2019, saying they had just called and agreed to rent the property to me. On December 29th, 2017, I obeyed the Lord's command to order a custom-built tiny house trailer to build our home on. The trailer was manufactured on January 31st, 2018. I built the tiny house and moved it onto the land for the first time on August 9th, 2019, exactly 555 days later, a number that had played such a dramatic role in my first story, Trusting God in the Storm. Then on September 25th, 2019, we saw God answer a long time prayer in the face of a huge risk I had taken as a father of my oldest son, Tyler. For six years, whenever he got the chance to sneak and have a call with me, I kept telling him that the Lord sees all of this, but doesn't want me to fight this parental alienation in the court, but to keep turning the other cheek, to keep trusting him, and that one day God would deliver us both when the time was right. Then, just as promised on his 18th birthday, after we faced a day of hellish satanic attacks, the Lord helped us to rescue Tyler from six years of parental alienation. We've been driving all night, um, man, after one unbelievable hellish day, and God came through for us, didn't he, son? Yes, he did. So we're getting ready to walk in right here. Here's Tyler coming in his new house for the first time. What do you think, buddy? It's nice. Isn't this cool? Yeah. Huh? You really yeah. like it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's now 7.26 p.m. on Monday night, September 30th. Yesterday morning, my parents called me and said they were woken up by two police officers in regard to the accusations and me uh, basically as a kidnapper and somebody who's put his life in danger. So today is Sunday, November 10th. It is 4.40 p.m. And Tyler and I are just outside of Orlando, Florida. Uh, we are coming down to appear in court on Tuesday at 1.30 to face some of the same old accusations uh, from my ex-wife in addition to 
a good number of new ones. Uh, God has already shown us, as I'll show in a few video clips, that he's going to deliver us. We're going down into the lion's cage again. So it's 6.07, Wednesday night, October 9th. Tyler and I are at our Walmart, and God has just answered a prayer while we were at the Walmart. We get out of the car. The prayer yesterday morning was, Father, do I need to do anything to defend myself coming up in court on November 12th? Do I need to prepare a bunch of paperwork and a defense for myself against all these accusations? So we get out of the car. We look right over here. First thing I see, 777. That's a reminder of the victory in court. We go to check out, and Tyler goes, Dad, it's 555. That's I will deliver you. Then I come back out to the car to get a set of blinds that I need to return. And we go to return the blinds and I get the re receipt. It's 1414. Immediately I think Exodus 1414. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to stand. So here we are right now. God has just answered the prayer. And now I know I don't have to do anything to def defend myself. Tyler and I are going to just go down, face the accusations, and God will defend us. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Wanted to capture the moment right on the spot. Brothers and sisters, wait until you hear the outcome of this video. I'm telling you, God has told me he is going to deliver, that the Lord will fight this battle for me, and I need only stand and watch his deliverance. You're going to get to see it. I'm going to film it right after we come out of the courtroom, and God willing, I'm going to capture what happens in the courtroom when we're there. May God bless you as you continue to listen, that you might, too, hope in him, trust in him fully. For his and now here I have driven the whole way here this morning with not even the slightest bit of uh, queasiness or uneasiness and so we are now just minutes away from the courthouse but I know that my God will deliver me and I our four other children saw it take place saw him videotaping this because he has some sort of a psychotic religious cult that he has online he came after seven years not to visit his five children he came to kidnap one child I was struck at midnight and he turned 18 because he has some sort of ill intent for that child. He has brainwashed him to believe we are the devil. We have demon possession. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ who's faithful as always. It's now 3.24 p.m. Tyler and I are having a celebratory dinner after we just saw an amazing victory again. This is the second time now where I've been brought back to court six times, but this is the second time where there were serious allegations made, um, and God had told me through Exodus 14, 14, that the Lord would fight for me, and I need only stand just to watch her do this for 30 minutes, pouring out all this, and then for the judge to speak to me, and I'm thinking to myself, now I have to defend myself against all these accusations, and he basically, as I said, Your Honor, I almost don't know where to begin. I never have. I said, I'd almost rather you hear from my son who's sitting outside he's wanted to testify for a long time and then he reminded me Michael she's provided no evidence and she's brought no uh, witnesses here today and I said oh I think I get it your honor and I think I'll just stand still since I don't need to defend myself anymore and he's like okay so here again the judge worked on my behalf and I did not have to defend myself it's absolutely amazing it's the exact word of God then, the following month, in December of 2019, I took another huge legal risk of faith to trust him, one that could have cost me my entire ministry, reputation, and freedom. I had posted on YouTube the recording from the November court hearing I made of her false allegations against me and of the judge defending me, just as the Lord had promised. She naturally filed a complaint whereupon a Florida judge sent me a letter threatening me with fines or imprisonment if I didn't remove the video containing the apparently illegal recording of the court hearing. The Lord told me to ignore the legal letter and to not remove the video. Over three years later, it is still up today and the Lord indeed protected me just as he promised. He will turn their own tongues against them and bring them to ruin. All who see them will shake their heads in scorn. Then, in 2020, I trusted him in faith to begin telling the story of my second spouse's tragic fall into Eastern mysticism and apostasy and of his promise to me that I would be delivered, I would see resurrection, and that I would not be put to shame. When she never came back, I shut down the ministry thinking I had been completely wrong and had become a false prophet, no longer clearly hearing from the Lord. 
21 days later, the Lord vindicated me in a way only his resurrection power can, raising both the ministry and again, my hopes for a godly marriage and helpmate. Hence this story, the grace to love again, even after being left by two unfaithful spouses, I had the grace and the faith to trust God again and how thankful I am that I did. On April 21st, 2021, I trusted him and took a risk by telling Lisa from New Zealand that he had shown me that she was to be my new wife. And to one of them, I am so very blessed and extra proud to call her my wife, Lisa Criswell. After following the ministry for five years, sticking with me through thick and thin, Lisa reached out to me via email in my darkest moment, being fully persuaded that God was still with me and that he most certainly had a resurrection for me. God found her faith to be so genuine that he gave her to me as my wife to replace the one who had rejected both he and I. I took this risk knowing so very little about her and having no idea how she would react. God blessed that act of my faith with the most indescribable gift and marriage relationship I could ever imagine. I now say that I've had two unfaithful spouses, but only one true wife. It turns out God's call for me to move to New Zealand back in 2019 had been irrevocable. And now that purpose of his was back on track in my life after removing my apostate spouse who refused to come with me the first time. Then on June 23rd, 2021, I trusted him in another act of very risky faith when he began leading Lisa and I to send the tiny house to New Zealand in advance of knowing if I would ever be able to emigrate there and follow. In prayer on June 23rd, 2021, my wife Lisa was in prayer and the idea of us bringing the tiny house to New Zealand would not leave her mind. You know, and she said, this could just be me, but I've been in prayer about this and I couldn't get this thought that came out of my mind about the tiny house about, what if you're still supposed to bring it to New Zealand? That day, we began praying about God sending us a $40,000 fleece to let us know if he truly wanted us to ship the house to New Zealand. Exactly five days later, the biblical number for God's grace, on June 28, 2021, we received notification of a $44,444 donation that was being made to us. The tiny house was towed away from my land to make its 8,000 mile plus journey to Auckland, New Zealand on August 2nd, 2021 So it's 7.44 on August 2nd, 2021, and the tiny house is gone. It just pulled out. It took two trucks. Exactly 40 days to the day after Lisa had those thoughts in prayer that would just not go away. The first day of land preparation after the house was initially built and ready to be lived in was on July 27th, 2019. I then hired the cargo company to ship the tiny house to New Zealand on July 27, 2021, exactly two years to the day from the first day of land prep. Then the tiny house spent its first official day parked in Auckland, New Zealand port on September 11, 2021 exactly 777 days from that July 27th first day of land prep, which was also the same day my then apostate spouse told me she could no longer wait to move forward with a divorce. Absolutely crazy. 
There she is! Wow! Oh wow baby! She's arrived! Wow! I've got it too! So surreal! Then, in 2022, the Lord called me to take my greatest risk of faith so far and to do it publicly as it was happening. In the face of God calling me by faith to move to New Zealand to marry and live with my godly wife, Lisa, I obeyed him and sent everything I own, including my tiny house and all my possessions to New Zealand, even though we now knew it was nearly impossible for me to ever be able to move there. From the day those bags left for New Zealand, it had been seven months and 30 days since God had me first ship the tiny house. Nothing else happened until the bags. Remarkably, this episode just so happened to fall on the one year anniversary of the day we shipped the tiny house. Oh my goodness gracious. God in Jesus' name, help. 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 Nope. 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 He's not getting any traction. Nope. 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 Come on, little tiny house. God help us in Jesus' name. Father, please send an angel to push that out. Wow. 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 Oh my gosh. I can't believe it. He's not getting any traction. Unbelievable. The tiny house tires are just dug in. The, the, the thing is sitting on the ground now. God, please help him get this out of here. Please, in Jesus' name. Please help him. Help him. Help him. There it goes. There it goes. There it goes. Wow. Praise God Almighty. Praise God Almighty. Praise God Almighty. Wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Wow. Oh my goodness gracious. Michael! Unbelievable, man. Wow. This is amazing. So the next time I see my tiny house for real, uh, we'll be with my wife in New Zealand. Praise God Almighty. This is amazing. Uh, what a Many Bible scholars say that the number seven represents God's perfection. Ide had been sentenced to seven years in prison, but the Lord didn't agree with that human sentence. In his perfect plan, I was released after seven months and seven days. Okay, so today is, what is today, Tyler? The 31st. The 31st of March. And so, sweetie, the bags are coming to you. This is it. This is, this is bag number cinco. And today is seven months and seven days since I had that horrible experience in uh, August 25th in Atlanta. So. By far, one of the most difficult obstacles to a loving and fruitful relationship with God is when he acts in ways that completely contradict our current human understanding of who he is and how we think he should work. I'm standing here exactly where I hoped I wouldn't be standing. My plane just left without me. Wow. I'm really sorry, sweetheart. I'm very, very, very sorry. But I actually, there's a part of me that it's like really weird. It's like, you know, no one to quit. And then there's another part of me that feels like, you know, is it possible it's not over? I just don't understand. I don't understand why God would have done all those things. And he's told us those several days where we hit, you know, the 21 days. I mean, we didn't get all of them, but we got most of them. And the 9-11 the, the thing and, and all that and the 44,000, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. You know, I mean, now I'm like worried about the tiny house and ah, oh, man, it's just horrible. This is horrible. 
Austin Sparks Teaching from The Cross and the City of God, Chapter 3. Walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith. Colossians 2, 7. Abraham was in the land, yet the very promises given him of God seemed to be denied. Was Abraham mistaken? Are we not sometimes bewildered with the Lord, and are not his ways past finding out? It all looks such a confusing mess, but as faith holds on, one day we shall praise him, and we shall see the reason for it all afterwards. These mysteries of the way contain some secret mystery of God And are they not another opportunity to show forth his wisdom and power? When all seems gone, the conflict so great, the experience so strange, and there is no key to the situation. We are tempted to question whether the promises were even of God to begin with. Everything is so contrary to what we expected. We begin to wonder if we were all wrong. Just then is the time for us to stand fast in the Lord and maintain that stand in faith. Many of us have had these similar experiences. There is a perplexity. There is apparent contradiction. There is terrible conflict. The forms of experience may vary, but it comes to all of us in some way or another. Still, He will remain faithful. In these perplexing events, you are coming to the place where you know the mystery of God, and it is a glorious opportunity for Him to show His wisdom, and so you are established having been made strong in the faith. The entire matter is all an issue of endurance. Then, in the ultimate act of dumping water on the sacrifice, God poured a tidal wave on it, making it most assuredly impossible for me to now ever move to New Zealand to be with my beloved Lisa. On December 30th, 2021, the word of the Lord came to me and I obeyed his leading to finally stop paying child support from my first divorce back in 2010. The children had been stolen from me through parental alienation and I had not seen or heard from any of them in nearly eight and a half years. To obey God in this meant I would forever have a child support balance increasing each month with interest and I would be labeled a deadbeat dad and a criminal, according to the U.S. government, never again eligible for a U.S. passport, and thus never would I be able to emigrate to New Zealand to be with my Lisa. Then, on April 16th, 2022, in a final round of pouring yet more water on the sacrifice and having God show that this would only ever be done by a supernatural act from His hand, a friend and a brother in Christ who knew about my child support balance offered to pay the full amount of it all off so that I could get my passport. Ironically, the Lord has never allowed me in 12 years to take money from anyone in my inner circle who knew the need, and this was no exception. So I obeyed once again and told my brother I could not accept his most generous gift. The Lord had told me to no longer pay the child support balance, And my only concern was to obey him, leaving the outcome of all things once again to him. When I look only at the impossible circumstances before me, the odds appear to be stacked heavily against me. However, when I look at God's past faithfulness and also at the unprecedented display of his power in my life, designing every single significant event to be fulfilled in a precise, biblically relevant period of time or date, 
showing his sovereign power over all people, spirits, animals, circumstances, events, and time, suddenly the odds appear to be stacked heavily against the circumstances, not me. Psalm 105, 19, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. You know, gold has must be put into the fire to get rid of all these impurities in it. It's the same way with our spirit. To get rid of this impurities, this sinful nature, God had to put us into this hot trials, not because he's the bad father, no, because he's a good father, you know. I want you to read Hebrews 12. And you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because, remember this, the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. You see, he disciplines only sons. Take any godly, great godly man in the Bible. Everyone had to go through the suffering. I'm telling the suffering is good. No matter how many arrows, negative thoughts you face from your own mind, from the devil and from the circumstances, from the people from your past don't give up you are at the border of this promised land i do not want you to give up all you have to do is do not give up your faith and trust in god do not give up